That's it for Steve Evans. Now, here's this week's Chart the Week. Here is Steve Evans. Hello, Richard. Oh, Steve. How nice to have you back on the programme. How lovely to be with you, mate. How are you? Yeah. I haven't spoke to you for ages. I know, I know, I know. I've been dying to speak to you. And it is because I came to see you in hospital. I came twice to the hospital at Wolverhampton. You certainly did. I spend a lot of time there now. It's a bit like a timeshare. <laughs> is it? Are you always in that same room? Uh, no, I was on a general medical ward last week and uh, it's not quite the same. Not quite the same. Uh, but uh, the care's still very good. You'll never find me criticising my, uh, my local hospital, New Cross. They look after me very well. Uh, so just to remind you, so Steve, we, we met, I think, about eight months ago. First of all, you appeared on the telephone on the show and you were hilarious. <laughs> uh, then we came to your house in Wolverhampton. We broadcast from your backyard and we've spoken to you many times in between. And um, you, you have stomach cancer and you, you've, you've shared your experiences with us on this journey. Um, and you've had your ups and downs. Just, just tell me a bit about what's been happening since I came to see you in hospital, when I interviewed you, of course. So uh, since we last spoke on the radio, what's, um, what's been happening and how have you been? Well, let, you know, Richard, that the, the journey's moved on, hasn't it? And I've always said to you that we've made this choice, haven't we, you and I, as friends, mm. to share the journey now with the nation on, on your, your radio show. And it, it's at a point where it, it's what we call in the final stages. We visited that last time. I, I think it needs a tiny bit of explaining. What's happened is that we've made a decision, and it's one that's featured on sort of news items from time to time about people who have got sort of celebrity you know they they make a decision not to have chemotherapy and it becomes a news item well well that's part of almost everyone's journey and we have made our own version of that decision and what it means now is that uh, we won't have any aggressive treatment uh, we'll just have care and when things happen they'll mend us you know, I don't want to be flippant, but they'll put us back on their bike and they'll dust our knees off and they'll send us on so I can have blood um, transfusions uh, when I, I need it and I can have a stent fitted to help with my eating, which I had last week. But we are trundling towards that ever-narrowing part of the path now. I'm on control medication, which isn't a, which isn't a, a terrible thing. It means that uh, I have pain control meds, I have sickness control meds, I've got them with me now. And, and that part of the journey has been explained to me. And you know, my friend, mm. this was the conversation you and I have had off air several times. What's it going to be like? And do you remember me saying to you that all of the people that are on the journey like ours, why aren't there answers? And very recently, I've come to the conclusion it's because the journey takes place basically in your mind. That's where it's mapped out. And these decisions to need the control meds and, and the type of control that's required is unique for each person. So that's where we are, friend. We, we're in a place that means you're probably not going to find me so super quick-witted, <laughs> mm. if I ever was, yeah. because obviously morphine sulfate has a certain calming effect. <laughs> but, you know, you say that, and I think people listening will be thinking, he sounds better than ever. That, that actually, compared to last time we spoke, and certainly two times ago that we spoke, you seem to me to be more full of energy and indeed full of life, that you sound great. Rich, it's just as if this has been planned, and of course it hasn't been planned. You see, what you create for me is a happy place. When I'm speaking to someone who is, uh, who is a dear friend, and I'm in a place where I like and I'm in this studio, and it's lovely, and, and, and uh, it is a, a sort of happy place, not one of my natural happy places, but it enables you to relax, and uh, that all of these emotions come together, and I will make a, a very throwaway reference again to the medication, that the medication is designed to give me this freedom, but... Uh, it, it is exactly that. I, I, I am upbeat, but it must be understood. And I'm never going to be dark in these conversations, my friend. Mm. Uh, it must be understood that this 
is hard. Yeah. If you want it to define absolutely appalling, it's this. And for other people that are experiencing it, it's important that they know for me personally that I'm in pain at the moment and I'm sharing their pain. And the fact that I come over this way simply means that I still have the same Steve outlook. Yes. I still have the same pains and suffering that they have. But remember what we've said. What makes our journey different to, to other people's? Well, too many people have cancer, mate. And too many people are life-limited. And, and lots of other people have the commonality of that, those elements. But how much love we have in our journey. And, of course, the thing that has changed since the last time we spoke was we went on breakfast television on a Saturday morning with 1,800 followers on Twitter. Mm. And we came off with 11,000. <laughs> no, it's amazing. And to yeah. all of them... I, I always said they are here I, with me I in Manchester. They travel with me. I, but, you know, I like that. That's, you, we, we've talked about this a lot. That, um, yes. You, this community, you, you have your actual friends, of which there seems to be an, an absolutely enormous amount. Uh, and then you have your Twitter friends. And all this has been very important to you, has been helpful to you. And I think there's obviously a lot of people that communicate with you who were going through a not wholly dissimilar experience. And I think that you sharing your experiences has to some degree helped them. Um, and we can put lots of people today, as always happens when you come on or emailing, who uh, are either um, uh, suffering with cancer themselves or a relative is. And, and that, that sharing of experiences, is, um, uh, I can see, is important to you and important to them as well. And we'll, we'll do more of that after three o'clock. I wanted to ask you just about your family, about your daughters, about your wife, Sep. Um, uh, how are they coping with everything at, at, at the moment, Steve? Um, I... I can never answer that, mate, can I? You, you notice that. I, I, I find it uncomfortable speaking for others, and I think that, that they are all suffering, because we're all suffering now. Because the, when, when we had the very bad incident and you came to the, the episode when I nearly uh, ended the journey and uh, you came to the hospital, um, th that was... That, that was testing for all, and that was when we sort of gathered the team. So the team is in place now, whatever that is, mm. and it's a team that supports itself, that talks to itself. It's a, it's a network of friends that are close by that find themselves talking to each other independent of me, giving themselves strength because that it is a difficult time for everyone. The one thread that ran all the way through our conversations yeah. was the importance of others, wasn't it? Was, it was, very much so. And I guess one thing I think we touched on last time, actually, when I saw you at uh, New Cross Hospital, is that uh, perhaps your closest friends and family m may not completely tell you how they feel because no. they want to stay positive yes. for you. Exactly they? right. And, and if we take us as, a, as, as quite an extreme, if, if our openness with, within, within the journey is something to, to behold and not common, in a, in, a, in a journey where there is a more sort of, I, I don't know the words because I don't want to use anything that is, that is negative, but, but a journey where people just find themselves with this horrendous circumstance heaped upon them, they will find it almost impossible. And certainly as they get to this time now, mm. I've always said, don't worry about upsetting people. Don't worry about words. If, if you have got someone close by and they are in my position, make sure they know how important that person is to them yeah. and how important they know they are to that person. Uh, D do it. Just, just do it. Because what are you going to do? Feel embarrassed. Steve, can you, because you sound so good today, and <laughs> you've made it clear you have the ups and downs, but you sound especially good today. Can you look ahead to Christmas now, Steve? Um, I can. And then yesterday, 
I spoke to a magic person. A magic person who you know, Richard. The Professor. Indeed. And I listened to not only his words, but the speed with which he talks. And I said, as a throwaway, well, you know, we'll get to Christmas. And he paused. And it was a very powerful pause. So, yes, I'm hoping we'll get to Christmas. But with these repeat episodes, they are the episodes that are going to bring the journey to a conclusion. Okay. We have got these, the medication in place to support me. And it's only there for one reason. Steve Evans, our great friend, my friend, is with me. Uh, we have got to, we've known Steve or got to know Steve well over the last eight months. He has stomach cancer um, and he is very funny. We met on the telephone initially on the radio and then we went to his house and broadcast from there. And uh, he is in the studio this afternoon. I certainly am. You most certainly are. It's lovely. It is nice, isn't it? I've never it? been in one of these before and, and everyone's just really, really nice. You've never been in a radio studio before? No, no. Well, I've got um, an ISDN box at home mm. where people can talk to me. Um, yes, they are. People are quite nice, aren't they? They um, are. They are here. Uh, uh, and, uh, Steve, you have... One thing I think it's worth saying is that you have outstripped, I suppose, expectations in a way, haven't you? That, you know, that you've been given different diagnoses. It's quite a long time since you were first diagnosed with cancer. And that uh, you have are always, um, I think, uh, exceeded uh, the uh, expectations of the professionals. Um, that's how it appears. What happens is when people give you a diagnosis, and I think this is important for anyone uh, to understand, y you can only give someone a diagnosis based on what has gone before, how a very large number of people have responded as an average. And when you start to respond, they then move you from box to box. And uh, so it is always hopeful that if you're a, a, a relatively young, strong person, um, you will exceed those uh, quite often pessimistic early assessments. Now, let's talk, we're just going to bring the guest here because um, uh, cancer uh, has been in the news today. Experts have been criticising Britain's position in the cancer league tables. A new international study says that Britain is lagging behind the rest of Europe when it comes to survival rates. A new international study, this is a report from the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, has compared health records from more than 30 countries and it found those with breast, bowel and cervical cancer fare worse here than in advanced countries, with only Poland coming in worse. Uh, Nell Barry is Senior Science Information Manager at Cancer Research UK. Nell, good afternoon. Hiya. Um, so Britain is doing terribly by comparison with other, other developed countries. Well, it's always depressing to see these figures in the news, but this isn't something that we weren't aware of. So we have known for a while that there are some types of cancer where survival rates are lagging a little bit behind the rest of Europe. And Cancer Research UK is doing a lot of work to understand exactly why that is, because that type of research is essential if we're going to fix the problem. But, yes, what is the reason for that? Because that does seem rather dramatic, doesn't it? So this is the health records of 30 countries have been compared and uh, all of them, apart from Poland, do better than us when it comes to breast cancer, bowel cancer and cervical cancer. Um, do, you, do you have a sense as to why that might be? So the research that we've done so far suggests that late diagnosis is a real problem and we know that that's the case for several specific types of cancer. So, for example, we know that there's some forms of the disease where you just don't get symptoms until the cancer is quite advanced and that makes it very difficult to diagnose those diseases at an early stage when treatment's more likely to be successful. So that's one key thing. We also know that access to treatments can be a problem. So one thing we're trying to do is encourage access, boost access for people to treatments like radiotherapy, which we know can save many lives. And really understanding why people don't get diagnosed earlier is the key thing that we need to do. Uh, Steve, you were diagnosed relatively early, I think, weren't you? No, very late. Were you? Yeah, um, I've got stomach cancer. And um, one, one's never flippant, Rich, when one talks about my pooliness, because obviously other people have the pooliness. Um, but uh, the, the simple point is, when was the last time you looked in your tummy? 
Mm. Uh, there's no symptoms. Um, there are symptoms, and there is uh, a couple of very good websites now uh, that you can just Google search if you just put stomach cancer. What are uh, they? What are the symptoms? There is a number of them, uh, but they breathlessness was mine, um, loss of appetite, uh, those sort of associated things. Uh, with mine, it was breathlessness, which meant that I was anemic. They thought I had... Uh, a stomach present ulcer, a duodenum ulcer, and uh, I hadn't. Obviously, I'd got uh, I'd got my tumour. And it's it's is it two years now, Steve, since you were diagnosed? Two years, two months. Two years, two months. And uh, is it your view that if you had been diagnosed early, if that had happened, um, you would be in a very different place now? Oh, it's medical opinion. I mean, if if they'd have got it when my stage was less than four, remember to recap for a moment t4 is when it has developed to such a stage it actually goes through uh, one organ and joins another and mm. then really it becomes mm. non-operable that's t4 if it was t1 or t2 it's very early stages operating would have been a, a viable option and um, i i would have uh, stood a very good chance of um, of surviving, but it must be putting because people sound bite these things and and they just grasp as they're driving along our conversations. No one did anything wrong. It's just the way the cards were dealt. No way could I have sussed mine earlier. I only sussed it this time is because I got out of breath going to see Carnie A. West, okay, as no. you'll remember. Yeah, I do remember. Now this is my final point to you, Nail Barry from Cancer Research UK. It, this. Uh, symptom. What we're talking about here is very important, isn't it? And relevant to everyone listening, really, is you've got to look for the symptoms and know the symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. And without the symptoms, you're not going to get an early diagnosis. And it's a lack of early diagnosis that has given Britain this awful place in the league tables for cancer, certain types of cancer. Um, uh, What can you do about that? Because the symptoms clearly for a stomach cancer, for example, aren't actually that obvious, are they? I can't imagine many people can find themselves short of breath and think, oh, I might have stomach cancer. So how do you tackle that problem? So the key message that we have for anybody out there who's worried about cancer is to know what your body is like normally. And if you notice anything unusual, just get it checked with your GP. A lot of people have this fear that they might be wasting their GP's time. They think, I'll just wait and see if it goes away. But it's always worth just going and getting things checked out. The difficulty with cancer is that there's many different forms of the disease. There's many different types of symptoms. So that's why the best advice is to just be aware of what's normal for you. And the other side of it, of course, is research to find out if we can diagnose these diseases earlier using things like blood tests through screening. And Cancer Research UK is funding a lot of research into those different forms of work and really just trying to find the best ways to find these diseases earlier and then to treat them in the best possible way once we've discovered them. OK, thank you very much, Nell. Um, thank you. Steve, just let me ask you this. Um, we were talking about you were talking about the episodes that you've had yes. and I mean you had an episode the first time I saw you in hospital the day before that or two days before that you'd have one of these very dramatic episodes yes have you had points in recent months where you thought you had come to the end of your journey where you went to sleep at night and didn't expect to wake up again yes how yes, many times has that happened it's happened once and um, I uh, it was the day after you came to see me my esophagus was completely closed I couldn't swallow um, I couldn't eat or drink, uh, and my tumour was bleeding from a place where they couldn't access. Um, so as quickly as they were giving me new blood, uh, I, was, uh, I was losing it. So I had the, uh, the conversation with the person that isn't there, and I simply said, if there's anything else to do, I'll, I'll do it. But, but if there isn't, I'll, I'll go now. And I was full of morphine sulfate, and I floated off to sleep. And three hours later, I woke up being able to swallow. The mm. radiotherapy had worked, and because I don't even know my own body, you know this. Yeah, I I, I'm know. hopeless oh. at, at looking after myself. <laughs> Are you? We, we asked you if you're looking forward to Christmas, and you said that you were. And hopefully, you know, the professor was very positive when you spoke to him yesterday about it. But you said you might have another episode, and that could happen at any time. The, and that, that the, the point of that conversation my friend and and thank you as a dear friend for selectively remembering um we have got contingencies in place for christmas um 
we, with the, the family have bought presents and we've had the conversation about what to do with the presents if it's not suitable to give them or perhaps at a point when we decide we might want to have an early Christmas. So we've had that conversation. We haven't had it in any depth and we haven't had it with an awful lot of eye contact. But we've, we've, we've had it so we, we're relatively comfortable because it was what the professor said. It was the pause, Rich. It was the pause that, that knocked me about. Because at any one time, these episodes, these events, um, they give me any amount of time. And any amount of time is also 24 hours. And okay. that's why things are different now. I mean, I, I'm still... As I said, when you're full of morphine sulfate, the life and soul of the party has a different definition because you're having your own party inside your head. Do you feel prepared? I don't know if one can feel prepared for something like this, but do you, uh, do you feel prepared for the end of the journey? Well, there's a point. I mean, it's a question that I can put out to everyone that's listening to this now. Is it for me to be prepared? Because what have I got to do? I don't know what I personally have to do because I know what will happen and it will happen. Um, so I have put all of my wishes in place. Everybody knows what I would like to happen and there will be an event at which you will be present. Uh, everyone has one and uh, mine has been organised including the venue. And we, we know where that will be, and that's very comforting. So I've done what's necessary so that when I don't experience this, this potential end-of-journey moment, that I'm not mithered about the unimportant. Okay. When, when I reach that point, mate, I want to be desperately upset that I'm no longer going to be with Septina. I don't want to be worried about the state of my study. Okay. I'm not interested in that. I want at that point to be able to focus purely on the only thing that matters. And let's talk to Andrew. Andrew joins us from uh, Peterhead in Aberdeenshire. Andrew, you're on with Steve Evans. What did you want to say? Hello, Richard. Yeah. Well, I've been following yourself and Steve since uh, you first came on because uh, I listened to Five Live from about 8 in the morning till 7 at night as I'm retired. Excellent. Um, the funny thing is I've admired uh, very much uh, the way he's going about it. Um, but now it's hit home because I found out last week that I have basically terminal bowel cancer. I'm sorry about that, Andrew. Yeah, it's one of those things. It's funny. <laughs> I'm almost not reacting to the name Andrew, but yeah, I know what you mean. Um, no. Yeah, it's... Uh, how old Stephen, by the way? I missed I'm, his age. I'm 52. What do you want to be called, mate, if you're not responding to Andrew? What do you want to be called? Well, I, Andrew's not his real name. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry oh, about sorry. that. Okay. I, don't, I don't know how the radio <laughs> works. Well, I'll, I'll call okay. you Andrew. Um, yeah, uh, well, basically, I'm a 73-year-old disabled war pensioner. Hmm. Um, and uh, the, we spoke before, actually, Richard, when you were covering uh, pilots who drank before they flew or uh, fell asleep when they were flying. Oh, uh, yes, I remember the conversation. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, this, this has hit home. Different than Stephen, I'm 73 now, but I'm the only one apart from my doctor who knows. I haven't told the family yet. This is the hard part, as uh, Stephen will realise. Myself, I'm in a, a reasonable position. I, I shouldn't be alive after the wars, etc. I've been in, blown up, shot down. One of the fortunate things is I still have my suicide pill from the Seven Year War in Oman, which I've kept. So for myself, you know, I can end it when I want to. I'm very concerned about, of course, it's who you leave behind. So I'm very concerned about telling my family and what the best way to do it is. Do you want me to chip in? Yes, of course, please do, Steve. Um, you, your family will know um, more than you think. No, no, they don't know. It's been so quick. Um, okay. I'm, I'm an idiot in some ways because, uh, because of my age. I get the, the bowel kits, you know, that you should send back in. Yeah. And I never did because I'm not going to get cancer, you know. After, yes, yes, I'm, 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 I'm else, with you on uh, that, Andrew, I'm with you on that. Yeah, so I didn't send those in, so um, it's, it's gone too far to do anything about. Well, you just have to decide what it is you want to do and who's important to you, don't you? Because I, I, 
I can tell you what I did, and I found telling people the most difficult of things. Mm. And, and all of my focus then became aimed at them. And it was no longer about me. Once you make the step to communicate your position to others, you then have to do something else, my friend, and that is you have to then take responsibility for the pain that you're going to create in those people. And, 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 and it is a big step, and it is a step people take, and they take it all the time. And all of my strength comes from other people. It, okay. it's, so once my family knew, all of my focus was with them and all of my strength comes from them. Andrew, all the best. Thank you. It's very nice to speak to you again. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Andrew. Let's, let's go to Margaret, who's called in as well. This is Margaret, who's in Glossop, uh, Glossop in Derbyshire. Margaret, good afternoon. You are on with Steve Evans. Hi, Steve. Hello, um, Margaret. I, hello. I'd just like to say how positive uh, you are. My husband died on the 28th of October with uh, stomach cancer, was treated at Christie for mm-hmm. two and a half years on Herceptin for a yeah. lot of that time, which was amazing. And then suddenly he started to bleed, like you say, yeah. blood transfusions, all of it, and the journey. We called it a journey exactly like you. Yeah. Um, and I just think you're so positive and just just good at relaying to people what does what happens and what goes on. Well, I'll tell I you what, Margaret, you, you tell me what you think, because my attitude is very simple. Uh, having terminal cancer, isn't that negative enough? Isn't, exactly, that, isn't yeah. what you and I have had to go through bad enough? We don't have to think of anything else negative. Can't we see the glass half full? <laughs> Why do we have I to o- see it empty? I always did. I always, always did. Did your husband, Margaret? Not really, no. <laughs> no. Um, it was a long journey. We had great friends and great family, but it's hard going, hard going. Yeah, it can't I... be anything else if you think about it, can it? No. And, and, but but it, it is doable, though, isn't it? Oh, yes, and you're inspirational. Well, I had to ring because I was listening, and I rang my phone and said, are you listening to this? Uh, and I just thought... I've never rang the radio before. No. I just I'm going to ring and talk to you. Well, I've never actually spoke. Other than doing the moaning, and may I say, Richard Bacon, <laughs> this is a little bit different to the moaning. Yeah, we need to get you back for that. You're, the yeah. scoring system you came up with is actually better than the one we've been using, so you're <laughs> definitely, we're definitely re- rebooking you for that. Um, uh, but, Margaret... Um, uh, thank you for phoning. That's a, Steve, it's a nice line and a nice way of looking at things when you said, isn't having cancer negative enough? Um, yeah. But I guess for some people, Margaret, it's, it, it, it's for some people, I guess it's hard not to feel angry uh, and not to feel a sense of injustice. No, not, not angry. No. Um, sad, because we could have done a lot more things. Yeah. But it's, I don't feel angry, because we had amazing treatment at Christie um, with a great guy. And uh, no, I just feel sad, not angry at all. OK. Uh, Margaret, thank you very much indeed. Have you enjoyed listening to Steve? Yes, very, very much. <laughs> Thanks, so. Margaret. He's the best. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, and hilarious. And we've we've in the end. We've had, um, uh, I think, uh, I suppose, a fairly uh, relatively serious conversation today, Steve. And I think yes, that's what we should we have, Richard. We, you know, you set me up with these things. I know. By starting the program with Stephen Moffat, <laughs> who is the man currently in charge of Doctor Who. And you follow him with a man who's got a terminal condition. And I've just got one thing to say to you, my friend. Please do. As this comes to a conclusion, regeneration. (laughs) How about that? (laughs) Now, that really would be an option, wouldn't it? Well, that's it for Steve Evans. Now, here's this week's Chart the Week.